Anyway, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on what time you're tuning in. Thank you for watching. I am Pastor Kevin E. Stafford, proud pastor of the Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church in Fresno, California. And this is our uh, broadcast that we call Faith, Facts, and Fears. Let me say this before you even start to thinking. Uh, no, I did not fire my co-host to my wife. Of course, the lovely lady, Margina Stafford. She's my co-host, and she is here in our live audience. But today, we've got a special show uh, featuring some young men who are my nephews and my son. Uh, and today, we've got a conversation that it really needed to be talked about. And so, it's all men today. Let me introduce you to... Um, our panel guests, and uh, matter of fact, let me let them introduce themselves. To my right, we've got. Um, hello, I'm Trey Janotum. I'm 13, and I'm coming from North Carolina. Um, my name is Amari Odom. I'm 15 years old, and this is my brother, Trey Jan. We're from North Carolina. Hi, my name is Noah Abbott. I'm 15 years old, and I'm from Inglewood, California. Hi, my name is Marlon Hyder. I'm 16, and I come from Fresno, California. So thankful to have our guests with us. Uh, audience, you can. There we go. Again, we're so grateful to have a live audience today, unlike our other broadcasts. But this topic is so important that not only did I want these young men uh, to be a part of the conversation, but I wanted a live audience because I believe this is a conversation uh, that needs to be talked about uh, far and wide. What is the conversation? Needless to say, needless to say, we're in a very um, difficult season. Not only are we dealing with the pandemonium that's produced by this pandemic, COVID-19 has got everybody uh, running helter skelter, and we don't know which way to turn. It's it's really rough right now. But on top of that, this is a season that is racially charged and so much has happened uh, so many young black men young black boys have been taken from us violently not only by uh, police the authorities those who are to protect and to serve but there have been those who've been killed by the hands of racist white people and um, it, it's a difficult season because the reality is um, this Black Lives Matter movement uh, is a movement that has gained some popularity, but the truth of the matter is uh, not only have black lives always mattered, but black lives have always been endangered. Um, and black men in particular are really an endangered species. So I want today to gather together my nephews uh, and my son representing different parts of um, the country, um, two from here in California, but different regions of California, right here, Noah from Inglewood, Southern California, and then um, mid Central California, which is a red part, a Republican part of a blue state. And then, of course, my two nephews, all the way from North Carolina. Um, and what I really wanted to deal with is how this, this season. Uh, and these struggles and these men, young black men who've been killed, how it affects these young men uh, and how, how they really respond to knowing that they have a target on their back. Um, the audience is going to be able to help me because I can't off the top of my head, because there's been so many, I can't remember all of the names. But uh, we know that George Floyd has sparked um, attention not only uh, from the state that he hailed from, but as well, the whole country. And let me take it a step further. The whole world uh, has now um, been drawn into the understanding that black lives are an endangered species. Uh, and so with these few moments that we share, you know, it's not a long show, 
I wanted to just deal with these young men uh, who I know well, um, who, for the most part, are sheltered from a lot of the racism because they come from good families. But it's real. And I wanted to know, guys, how does it affect you um, to know, first of all, that young black men are being killed by those who are supposed to protect them? Um, Trajan, you're 13. But he's the same. My, my nephew, he's going to be a star athlete of some kind because uh, he's 13, but he looks, he's almost as tall as his uncle. Uh, and he's got some good genes, so he's, he's going to go somewhere if, in fact, um, he's able to grow up in a normal environment without having to worry about being um, assassinated by the hand of um, what I'm going to call the enemy. Trayton, how does it feel uh, as a 13-year-old? Do you even think about the fact that there are young people uh, that are your age, just recently, young man got pulled over by the police uh, for jaywalking and got roughed up. Do you even think about that? Um, so all the time I think about this stuff. It's like the crazy thing about it, since we're all, we're, I'm an athlete, we're all athletes, I can just go out and take some exercise and bike ride. And at any moment, uh, a per, like a random white person can just call the police and say, I'm doing something suspicious. And then they can just come, arrest me, just do anything they want to me. They have full control. And like, they might not know my exact age, but just just because I'm bigger and I look I look like a, a older grown man, they can. Just... Wow. wow, that's tough. That's tough. At 13, I don't think a 13 year old should have to worry about that. Uh, but maybe I'm biased. I don't think a 15, 16 year old should have to worry about that either. Guys, weigh in on that. I mean, you guys are from North Carolina. Um, Trey and Amari, you guys are, are living in North Carolina. Do you have any thoughts about that, Amari? I mean, you see, I, he's got the football in his hand, but he's a star athlete as it relates to football, basketball, and baseball. But, you know, what, what do you think about that? Um, your athletic future can be taken from you. I mean, talk about that, man. Well, really, my athletic future is – could be in the hands of me, it could be in, in the hands of a white person or a police officer, the enemy, um, because I could be doing something spectacular in my eyes or in other people's eyes, but in their eyes, it could be suspicious or it could just be like a crime. So, to be honest, I, it's scary at times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like the other day, I just went on a jog in North Carolina and it crossed my mind what uh, Ahmaud Arbery, um, his, his, trage his tragedy happened. Um, that crossed my mind when I was on a job, and sometimes it, it is actually scary, especially mm. in North Carolina, the, the red state. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Noah, man, listen, you're from the Woodwood, right here in Inglewood, man. And, uh, you know, I, I won't brag on your accolades. You're an athlete, but you're also an actor and handsome young fella and got a lot going for you. Come from a great family. You would think here in uh, sunny Southern California, uh, with all the glitz, glamour, and glory, uh, and and with your accolades, you wouldn't have to worry about um, racism or anything. Have you ever had to deal with it at all? Oh, yeah, plenty of times. Plenty of times. Uh, I go to a school in Santa Monica where it's predominantly white, and it's, I'd say maybe ten percent black, mm. and I, I face racial profiling lots of times. You know, maybe walking to maybe get a uh, bite to eat after school with my friends. People may look at me suspicious. Um, if I'm walking down the street, I see cops, I start to feel a little nervous because I don't know if maybe they might think I'm doing suspicious. They might think I'm, it's a crime. Hmm. They might feel a threat. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Marlon, tell me what you think about white privilege. Is it real? Do you understand it? What is right, white privilege to you? And how does it make you feel? Well, I feel like white privilege is when like, white people basically get anything they want, have anything they want, you know what I'm saying? Uh, whereas black people like us, we have to work hard for what we have, whether as in terms of like sports and houses and things like that. But I just think that sometimes they're given things and we have to work for more than what we have. I feel like we start at the bottom. 
and they 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 get a head start in the race. Or falling behind. Marlon is uh, a profound basketball player as well. He's got the basketball in his hands. Uh, and it's interesting to see my son grow up. His, his physique is changing. His voice is changing. And uh, I'm watching him grow up right in front of our eyes, my wife and I. And i got to be honest, um, I'm, I'm afraid, and I'm a pastor, but fear is real. Uh, I know God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, of sign mind. But, but in the natural, I'm concerned because uh, I recognize uh, my wife and I are always watching CNN uh, and always keeping up to date with, with the happenings. I recognize sometimes we don't want him to go to the gym, which is right there, uh, not even a mile from our campus, of, out of concern that one false move and his life can be taken. The white privilege thing, what's happening is I think it's becoming more apparent to a lot of people. Um, in these protests, what I'm seeing, uh, and it's different from, uh, you know, we've had protests in times past. You guys weren't, weren't even born. I was born in 67, but in 65, I believe it was, was the Watch Riots. Uh, and it was racially charged, and they tore up uh, the Watts area, the Los Angeles area, uh, and then I believe it was 1967 in Detroit. Uh, they had another um, riot that they tore up, re predominantly Detroit. And then, then you guys were even born in '92 um, when they had the Rodney King beating right here in Los Angeles. You guys probably have read about these things in the history books. Rodney King was pulled over and he literally was beat down by some white police officers, LAPD, uh, with batons. It was caught on tape, uh, and the four officers got acquitted, uh, and L.A. went up in smoke. Well, fast forward to just recently when uh, the young brother, uh, Brooks, um, he, he got assaulted by the police officers, and George Floyd, George Floyd, uh, Richard Brooks was Wendy, right? Y'all yeah. supposed to help me with that. <laughs> but Richard Brooks got pulled over at Wendy's, and uh, he got killed. But before that, just weeks before that, um, George Floyd, and everybody knows about that. To the point where not only did it start uh, a protest and unrest locally, but they're still protesting around not only the country, but the whole world. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Yes. The whole world now is chanting Black Lives Matter. What does the word or the term to you all, Black Lives Matter, mean? Speak on it. What, when you think, when you hear Black Lives Matter, what does that mean to you? See, Black Lives Matter. We're not saying we want more. We just we just want to matter to people. We want to be. We don't want to be racially profiled. We want to have the same. We want to be treated equally. Treated equally as any other race. Uh, Asian, white. You know, just minorities. Also Latinos. We, we don't matter. You know? Okay. I feel like right now we we don't we, people don't really treat us right. Hmm. Is that people in general, or is that um, the the white race, or white, white race, maybe even Asian race? I say maybe not more of the Latino race, but some, we have some some Latinos that that do have that. that but I say white race, Asian race, but to everybody, I feel like that's not black. We're we're a threat. Okay. Well, somebody else speak on it. What Black Lives Matter? What does that mean to you? Well, I feel like there's kind of like a social hierarchy, and somewhere in between there's Mexicans, Latinos, um, Asians. But one thing I know for sure is that the whites are at the top and the blacks are at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that they, the white people, feel like they can just treat us any type of way, and even even Latinos feel like they can just treat us any type of way. I feel like anyone in between can fit feel like they can treat black people in any type of way. And I just think 
is really unfair because we're just, we're just we're humans just like everyone else, just mm-hmm. trying to live. But because of the color of our skin, we're, we've been beaten, we've been killed, we've been enslaved, and I think that a big change needs to happen. Hmm. Okay. Great. Um, so, like the Declaration of Independence said, all men are created equal. In the U.S. and like all around the world, that's definitely not true. Whites are at the top, blacks are at the bottom, and then you have all the other mixed races in the middle. Um, it's just like, it's just like, Black Lives Matter, it just means like, we need, we need like, our, like, we need to be important to people. Like, to other people, we're just not important. Like, we're nobody. Like, uh, it's just like, we're nobody to other people, and like, we just need to be, we just need to be known. We just need to get our voices heard. From the 13 year old, he brought up the Declaration of Independence. Come on, audience. Good stuff. So, Amari, speak on it. Black Lives Matter. What When you hear that, what does that mean to you, man? Oh, I can't really say much else because these three, they just took it all. They nailed it. Yep. They really did. It's basically what all they said. Like, we're at the bottom. Everybody else, they don't. They don't think we're important to any. They don't think we're important in their eyes. In our eyes, we think we're we're each other, like we're equal. But to everyone else, they think we're a threat. What Marlon said, but they just don't take us seriously. Hmm. Well, I want to say a couple of things about that. I want to get to also. I want you to think about this. You all stated facts as you feel them. I want to know, and I want you to think about this. I'm gonna have another uh, question, but this question I want you to start thinking about. How does that make you feel? I really want you to, to tune in, hone in on how it makes you feel. You're, you're stating facts as you know them. Each of you have stated how you feel as though every other race, and particularly the white race, feels that you are inferior and they are superior. And pretty much you guys have stated that you feel like you're on the bottom of the totem pole. Um, that has to... Um, really promote some kind of feeling. And, and a lot of times, um, black men are not supposed to feel. We're, 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 we're placed in a position that we're, 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 we're um, abused and we're not supposed to have any response. Thus, the, oh, he's just an angry black man, as though we have no reason to be angry. Uh, and I want to put words in your mouth, but I want you to really think about being uh, minimized, being looked down upon, how does that make you feel? I mean, you, you can look at it from any different perspective. If you're pitted against uh, somebody that is not of, a, of your race, and let's say athletically, you know that you're better than them. But because of perhaps white privilege, they get the spot you don't. And trust me, if you feel that now, wait till you get into the working world. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> uh, but I want you to start thinking about how it makes you feel. And, and while you're thinking about that, I want to throw this out there. Um, audience, don't trip. This is uh, 4th of July. <laughs> and uh, I have my audience. <laughs> 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 right, we are in the board. Uh, and that's what happens when you have a live audience. <laughs> Quiet on the set, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is a reality show right here. <laughs> um, people are really, and I'm, I'm going to use the colloquial expression, people are really tripping off Black Lives Matter. And people are countering that Black Lives Matter with All Lives Matter. All Lives Matter. And, and let me say this. It's not as though I don't agree with that. All lives do matter. I'm a humanitarian. All lives do matter. However, here's the caveat. If my house is on fire and the fireman comes because I've called him, I don't want the fireman to go water down all of my neighbor's houses before he takes the hose and puts the fire out in my house. That's just an analogy to say, look, black lives are the ones that are on fire. Black lives are the lives that are in danger. All lives do matter, but 
Listen, black people right now, uh, more than anything, are are now being recognized. The, the tragedies and atrocities that have happened to us have, are now being recognized by a, a greater majority. Uh, so yeah, all lives do matter. But right now, um, Asians don't have. Uh, the the concern that we do when driving down the street and the police get behind them, um, Hispanics, not not as much as we do. Uh, so, yeah. Black Lives Matter in that we are the lives that are most endangered. How does that make you guys feel? And you can get however whatever you want to go into. It doesn't matter. I, I want to know how it makes you feel on a gut level. Does it hurt you? Does it does it anger you? Does it frustrate you? How does it make you feel, guys? Um, so, this makes me feel very, very angry. Like, like all to all the racist white people out there, and like not just white people, like Hispanics and like Asians. It's like, I just really want to do something out of much anger, but I know I just can't. I just have to wait, like protest, do uh, speeches and stuff, like raise, like just do stuff to like get my voices heard, but that takes time. Like, if someone else, like, like not a black person, like a white person, they want to make a change, they can just do one thing and then they have it. But we have to go through a multi-step process to get what we want. That's your stuff. Good stuff, Fred. When people, to me, when people counter that Black Lives Matter with All Lives Matter, that frustrates me more than... I would say a little more than the things that actually happen to say Black Lives Matter. Because you're not accept people who say all lives matter aren't accepting the fact that Black Lives Matter and that they have to matter first before all lives can matter. We can't, another analogy is, if you have five children and one children gets hurt, you're gonna put a ban in on one children. You're not gonna put a ban in on all five children. So like, Black Lives can't matter. I mean, all lives can't matter until Black Lives Matter specifically. Black Lives Matter, and when people say all lives matter, you know, as Amari just stated that, you know, we just want to be mattered, like how all, all the other races are, are mattered. You know, black lives, I feel that maybe if I see a police officer, that he might maybe think, oh, he's doing something wrong, hmm. he's committing a crime. You know, I have a case where I'm coming from my audition, and, um, I should never been putting on a, a do rag, but as I'm leaving the audition, uh, cops pulled me and my mom over and say that the car was stolen. And wow. when, when I'm in that car, I'm thinking, "Oh, is this is this gonna be scary?" Like, I'm, I'm very, I'm nervous. Like if, anytime I encounter a police officer, I start to get very nervous because I don't know what's gonna happen, or how they're gonna look at me, or what they're gonna think of me. So. Wow. Mm -hmm. So so basically, it, it is frustrating that you're not on equal playing field. Yeah. You're coming from an audition as an actor, a fellow thespian. <laughs> and, and literally, because you're pulled over, there's an assumption because you got on a do-rag. I mean, you know, I used to wear a do-rag when I had some hair. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a do-rag, but it immediately makes... Some people feel as though you're a threat. And that's that's just not fair. It, okay. Okay. What do you got on it, Marlon? Well, it's scary, but it's also it, it's very frustrating. It's it's scary to me because like 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 um all of them said, we're all athletes. So um we could be going on a job like Amari was, we could be riding our bike like trade we could be just throwing a football with a friend and then um a police officer or someone could call and um think of us as a threat. As some people would say, but me personally, I um, go to the gym every day, as you guys know. Every time I ride my bike, I'm always looking over my shoulder, or every time I'm at the gym, I'm always looking around, being cautious, because um, there are some people out there that think all lives do matter, or black lives don't matter at all. So that's that's what some white people, and quite frankly, some other people feel like. So um, that, it's, it's frightening, because mm -hmm. your life could just end just like that, just because someone thinks you're scary or a threat to someone, but it's also frustrating because um, 
like Amari, you guys um, gave an analogy that um, if the house is on fire, you're not going to go to the other houses that are perfectly fine. You're going to take out the house that is on fire. And I feel like, like you said, black, like our, our lives are just very unhuman. It's very unfair. Well said. Well said. Well. Listen, I said something, and I want to clarify. Um, the enemy are not the white people. The enemy, uh, it, it's not, uh, it, it's not any individual. Um, I think that we're wrestling against a systematic and institutionalized racism, a system that has not been set up to favor us. Uh, from its very uh, implementation, and and you know we can talk about the Constitution and and how unfair it is from its origin, uh, and how it it, it um, literally um, was put into place to keep us in place. But I want to take it a step further and go deeper because this is a show about faith as well as facts and fears. And from a faith perspective, and that, that's the perspective I want to come from, scripturally speaking, guys, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians, that sixth chapter, and uh, I'll paraphrase it, but I want you when you get a chance to read it, uh, around about the 10th tenth, tenth verse, he says, uh, you know, finally, brethren, uh, be strong in the Lord and power his might. Goes on to say, put on the whole arm of God. And then around verse 12, he says something that I need us to hear. For we wrestle not against flesh, and blood. He goes on to say, but against principalities and powers, ultimately spiritual wickedness in high places. This thing, guys, what we're talking about here is much bigger than socialism, racism. Uh, it, it's, it's so much deeper and so much bigger uh, than just Black Lives Matter. It, it's on a spiritual plane uh, at its core um, demonic. It's, it's, organi it's organized um, and demonic. It's a, it's a force that's bigger than the flesh. So, so the white man and our enemy, uh, black men are, are not um, the enemy of, of, of white people. It, it, it's bigger than that. Flesh and blood it is, it's not what we're wrestling against. Scripturally speaking, the enemy, which is the devil, has from the very beginning, try to divide and conquer. Um, Trajan, you mentioned something uh, that uh, the Constitution says, all men are created equal. Yes, we are. God created us from the dust. In the imagio Dei, which is the image of God, breathed in us the Ruach, which is the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And all of us are, are precious in the sight of God. But but that, the devil, the demonic forces, want to divide and conquer. Uh, and, and we are um, deceived by the hand of the adversary. Uh, our fight is not against each other. And if we ever get to the place where we understand all of this is spiritual mm -hmm. and that um, ultimately we must bow down in humble submission to our creator, um, I think it'll bring a bigger and better perspective. You all, I appreciate your time. I really do. I appreciate uh, your perspective. And I really wanted uh, our audience to see how it affects young black men um, and, and your perspective on all of this. It's critical. It's crucial um, because there are some facts. The facts speak for themselves. We are, as black men, an endangered species. We are as black men uh, walking around with a target on our back. Uh, you can't drive while black. You can't walk while black. You can't chew gum while black. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, however, the bigger picture is, and I want us to remember this, um, God is in control. And we must embrace and understand the bigger picture uh, because in accordance with, as believers, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people were called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and get this, I'll heal their land. 
that that's a universal total healing from the coronavirus to to racism every and anything that is wrong with this world our god has the power to heal it but it takes black men who know god who remember their creators in the days of their youth that we turn to god and and, and turn it over to him hoping and praying uh, that ultimately uh with hands up not not in fear uh, of the man but in reverence for God, God can make a way out of no way. Listen, thank you again, each of you. I appreciate you. I wish we had more time to take um, some audience questions, but listen, uh, we're at 31 minutes already, uh, but it's been a good, good show. And I'm hoping and praying that as you've tuned in to all of our viewers, that first and foremost, you've been informed. You, you've been able to see a perspective from some young black men who all they want to do is just live their lives uh, free from fear of, of any type of racism, any type of abuse, any type of, of um, uh, force that would uh, cause them to lose their lives. They just want to, they just want to be young men, uh, beautiful black men whose lives matter. And I wanted you to hear from their mouths, their perspectives. But then also, this show is Faith Facts, uh, or Fact, Fear, what is it? Facts, Faith Facts and Fears, my own show. <laughs> Listen, I needed to bring that perspective to the listener because ultimately, um, Tyler Perry um, started singing a song and challenging people via Facebook um, the social medias, he's got the whole world in his hands. I think this is a great time to really recognize that really, really, really God does have the whole world in his hands. And if there is to be any help, if there is to be any healing, it will come from the hand of our God. To that end, now is as good a time as any. If you're not saved, you don't know the Lord Jesus in the parting of your sins. You've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. I would challenge you, um, get to know him. He's a friend that will stick closer than any brother. And all you got to do is confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And that ultimately is my story. I'm sticking to it. And I bless God for each of you who've tuned in. Thank you uh, to our live audience today. Again, thank you to our panel guests. And God bless you. Uh, as always, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and give you peace. That's my prayer. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Amen. Amen.